Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a, a new session. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe Jafina, is it okay if you can lead us in prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, we invite your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for everyone who has joined us. Help us to open our hearts and eyes and understand every single thing that our pastor is teaching so that we can apply it and we can preach the gospel boldly. We place everything in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. All right. So uh, we've come to the last section. Uh, I know it's been a long study, a uh, lot of material that we covered. First, we looked at the covenants and how God placed all these wonderful covenants, speaking to uh, Abraham, to Moses, to David, uh, these wonderful covenants that he is still, you know, so faithful to keep. Uh, then in the second section, we looked at the cross, which we completed uh, last class. We looked at how the cross is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened in humanity. The cross was not something that is a second thought. It's not an afterthought, but the cross was a place. The Lord Jesus uh, in the scripture says that before the foundation of the world, we preach Christ crucified. So Jesus knew what was ahead of him. And we looked at what Jesus did when he went on that cross, what he achieved for us. He completely nullified, destroyed the powers of the devil. He completely broke the chains of the enemy. He has, Colossians chapter one says, he, he defeated the enemy completely. Right? We also saw how, you know, uh, because of sin that entered through Adam, we all fall into that sinful nature. Uh, but Christ, because of what he did, we don't have to live in sin, but we can live uh, uh, righteous before God. And, and so we looked at all these wonderful truths. But what is important for each one of us as believers is that we must live this truth. Right? Every day of our lives, Every moment of our lives, we must say, God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that without the cross, we are nothing. Without the cross, we will be just sinners and we will be, uh, you know, uh, it led to eternal damnation. But it is only because of the cross that we are where we are. Right? And so here is our authority as believers. We must use this authority that Jesus has given us. Right? Remember what Jesus said? He said, I have given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. This is while he was alive. He was talking about what he was going to achieve in the future. So you and I have authority. We do remember that the enemy is a defeated foe. Yet he's able to do so much damage in this world. But we as his children must know, must understand that we are free from sin. Now, some of the important points we learned from the whole aspect of the cross was one, we are not in condemnation anymore. Right? Uh, remember we studied about the covenants, how they would make you know, the, their offering and they will go back home, but there was still guilt. There was still condemnation. There was still the feeling of, you know, there is sin in my life. The book of Romans says it beautifully. It says, therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? Then we also looked at how in the old covenant, there was just a covering of sins. But in the new covenant, there is washing away of sins through the cross. Right, And so all these wonderful truths, I know that we all know these truths, but the it really impacts us when we begin to live in it, right? So I would encourage you, uh, you know, whenever you have time, whenever you feel, uh, you know, you want to study more, just go back to these portions, 
refresh yourself. Say, God, I want to thank you uh, for the covenants that you have given us. Thank you for the blood, for the cross of Christ. Thank you for through the cross. You know, there's this wonderful saying, the cross is a place where there are four absolutes in life, right? Uh, one is sin, two is justice, three is love, and four is forgiveness. These are the four absolutes of life, right? It's going to be there. And all these four converge at the cross of Jesus Christ. The sin of the entire world was put on Jesus Christ. The justice, the righteous justice of God, the Father, was placed upon his Son. It was a place of love where John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus died on the cross for us because he loved us. And for forgiveness, where even to the point of death, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know, know what they are doing. Four absolutes in life, all four beautifully converge at the cross. So the cross is the most powerful place uh, in entire humankind. And we, as his children, are so privileged uh, to be partakers of the cross. All right, so that's wonderful. Let's go into section three, which is our last section, talking about the blood. Uh, all of us, I'm sure we all have used these, you know, uh, words where we pray, or where we're declaring prophetic words. We say, you know, cover us by the blood of Jesus, or uh, we say, cover our homes, cover our families with the blood of Jesus, right? So what is the significance of blood, right? We say, by the blood of Jesus, we declare that you are healed. Uh, so what is the significance of blood? Now, the word blood is important both in the Old and in the New Testament, right? Uh, in the Old Testament, we see that, uh, you know, blood was shed, right? Uh, the, even in Genesis, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, all the way to Revelations 19, right? Where Jesus is, remember, Jesus is riding on the white horse and uh, uh, and, and clothed in, uh, in a cloth, in a dress, dripped in blood. Right? So all the way from Genesis to Revelations 19, there's this aspect of blood. Now, we did study about the blood covenant. But what is this covenant? What is this blood by the blood of Jesus? What is it that it carries? Right? Uh, we know that blood is life. But what is so unique about this blood of Jesus? You know, many people have died. Many great leaders have died. But what is so unique about the blood of Jesus? Right, We sing songs about it, right? Oh, the precious blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. Right, In the Old Testament, the blood prefigures or foreshadows the atonement of Jesus Christ. Remember the Old Testament? The high priest would take the blood and he would put it in the altar. That's a prefiguring of what Jesus would do uh, as a high priest. Right? Remember, we studied that Jesus went up to heaven and he gave his own blood to the Father. Once for all, making atonement. So he doesn't have to do it again and again. Once for all, this whole prefiguring, the shadows of this, you know, the altar, the tabernacle, the day of atonement, all of this, all of that can stop because Jesus, as a high priest, offered his own blood to the Father, once and for all. It's not like Jesus has to go back and say, okay, uh, you know, let me do it once again, or every year, you know, Jesus has to remind the Father, right? Uh, you know, Father, this is the blood, just in case you forgot. No, it was do it's done once and for all, right? Let's look at a few references in the Old Testament. I'm sure we've already done a couple of these, but let's look at a few of them. Uh, a covering for Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Uh, Adam, sinned, uh, Adam and Eve sinned. They knew that they were naked and God asked them, how do you know that? And, go, and, and you know, it was sin. And so God himself made the first uh, blood sacrifice and he killed an animal and he covered them, right? The second one would be the acceptable sacrifice of Abel where Abel's offering was more pleasing to God because it was uh, uh, it was blood that was provided, the shedding of blood, 
so covenants made by blood, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, uh, all of these are life-giving covenants, right? Um, now, the priests consecrated by the blood and the anointing oil, what the priests would do in, on the Day of Atonement is they would first be anointed with oil. Right? Remember the high priest, the first high priest, Aaron, they poured the oil, he was anointed, the, the oil went down his beard. So oil was a representation, uh, again, a foreshadow of what the Holy Spirit would do in the new covenant. So he was anointed with oil. Then he would take the sin offering, go into the Holy of Holies and make the offering. And then they had the burnt offering. Now, what is the difference between these things, right? The burnt offering was an offering that everyone could do, right? As in the old covenant, everyone could do it, right? It was just an offering to get your relationship restored with God. So everyone would partake of it. The peace offering was more of, God, I want to thank you for blessing me and meeting all my needs, blessing my family, blessing my children. So they would do a peace offering. But on the Day of Atonement, they would not do that. Only the high priest would do. And what the high priest would do is he would take the ram that was killed, he would take the blood, and he would put it on his right ear, on his thumb, on the right hand and on the right toe, right? So these three places, he would, he would place drops of blood there. Now, why these three places? Right ear, what you hear is protected or covered. What you do, that is your right thumb, is righteous unto God. Three, your right toe, where you go, must be holy and sanctified unto the Lord. So that's what the high priest would do. Right? You put the take the blood of that ram, which would go for the Day of Atonement. You take a little of that blood, you would place it, put a few drops on his ears, on his right thumb, and on his right toe to signify these three things. Now, we will talk about what the blood of Jesus did uh, through that, right? Uh, the, the same prefiguring. Uh, then, atonement for sin by the blood. Now, we did look at this uh, previously as well, what Jesus did on the cross was he made atonement. He was our substitute. He went in place of us. Now, we were supposed to be on that cross in place of, instead of, he took our place. Right? Uh, and so he made atonement for our sins. Remember last week we spoke about how, uh, you know, the Father, how Jesus, what he did was he, he, he took the blood and he went to the Father and he made atonement, meaning he's, he told the Father, now when you look at the people, look at them through my eyes or look at them through the work that I've done on the cross, right? So, so when the Father looks at us, He's not looking at us, uh, you know, and, uh, okay, these people are sinful people. Right? But he looks at us through the cross. We, yes, we, you know, there, there will be people who, uh, you know, are living in sin and all of that. But when the father looks at us, he looks at us with love because of what, he, what Jesus Christ did through his son, Jesus Christ. Right? And that is such a wonderful thing, right? The blood that was shed on the cross satisfies the demands of God's justice. Now, what does the blood do? First one, in the old covenant, covering of sins. Two, it's an acceptance of offering. Three, the covenant is established. Transition from slavery to freedom. In a blood covenant, people were consecrated, right? which means kept sanctified, kept holy unto God. And 
finally, the blood covering made atonement for sin, resulting in forgiveness of sins. Right Now, this is what the blood did in the old covenant. Now, when we look at the new covenant, it is not the blood of goats and rams, but the blood of the sinless one. The blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who was without any sin. Let's look at that. The blood of Jesus, who is the Lamb of God. Jesus was a sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Let's read John chapter 1 and verse 29. John 1 verse 20, 29. Yes, could anyone please read this? John 1 and verse 29. Let's go ahead. Any one of us. John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right, amen. Thank you, Delfina. John the Baptist is saying, he's testifying of Jesus and he's saying, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who told John about this? How did John know that Jesus is going to be the Lamb? I'm sure John would have first, the first thing that, uh, you know, uh, would have come to John's mind is the, is the Lamb on the Day of Atonement. The, the ram that was cut and the blood. The first thing that would have come to his mind was that. But when he looked at Jesus, he said, now... Look, this is the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. This person that you see, right? First Peter 1, 18 to 20, I'll read that. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold or silver from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was indeed was he indeed was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, listen to this. Peter is writing to mainly the Jews who have become Christians, but it's, he's writing it to a cosmopolitan crowd. There were some, uh, you know, Gentiles as well. But as a Jew, if I'm listening to this or I'm reading this, he's saying knowing that we are not redeemed with corruptible things like gold, silver, but we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and, or without spot. Now, as a Jew, what is the first thing that will come to my mind? I'll say, oh, a lamb without blemish and spot. That's what I did before. That's what I would go to. I would go on the day of atonement choose the best lamb without blemish, without spot, and cut that lamb, take the blood, go uh, and uh, offer it to the high priest, and the high priest will uh, you know, go into the Holy of Holies. Now, Peter is calling that, and he's saying we, we are not redeemed by any of that now, but we are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, the bl lamb without blemish, and this blood, this man, the blood of Jesus, the lamb, was there before the foundation of the world. But he was made manifest. John writes it so wonderfully in John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Right? So Jesus was being God. He humbled himself, came into this world as a lamb without blemish that is why we we studied right even one sin you know one sin if jesus had committed there would be blemish right even one sin but he was faithful he was obedient and he did it for you and me revelation 38 says all who dwell on the earth will worship him 
whose names have not been written in the books of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Again, bringing the whole aspect of the Lamb. Right, right now, the Lord Jesus, He's seated in heaven. He's a Lamb, and He's the Lion. Right, uh, and it's so beautiful to see that these two aspects. He's gentle as a lamb, the lamb that was taken to the slaughter. The Lord Jesus, that you know, when you hold, when you look at the whole picture of what had happened, you know, uh, we were studying about the cross, how Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus was taken; he was arrested, taken into prison, beaten. What is all of that? Could not remember. We studied about that. Peter cut off the soldier's ear, and and then. Uh, Jesus says, put off your sword. If if I wanted, will not my father send legions of angels to come and protect me? Right? So Jesus was like a lamb. He was just quiet. He said, okay, it's time for me to go to the slaughter. It's time for me to be given as a burnt offering. So he was quiet. Right? Uh, and now the Lord Jesus is a lion and a lamb. Right? He has done what, what, what uh, the old covenant promised. He has done it. Right? His blood has been shed. And if he has become the substitute for all mankind once for all, he has completed the offering for sin. And now there's no more need of any more offerings right hebrews 7 24 to 27 brings that out wonderfully but he because he continues forever has an unchangeable priesthood right his priesthood does not change the high priest used to change every probably every three four years but here he does not change Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not daily need, sorry, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for he did this once for all, he offered up himself. Right? He did it once for all. So we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Now, can you picture this? When you, when you think about it, we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Right? Uh, I remember talking to this person from another faith. This happened many years ago. And he was living a very sinful life. Right? He, he shared with me, you know, he was into addictions uh, and all kinds of, you know, wrong habits. Uh, but I was sharing with him. And every time I was sharing with him, I kept getting this, word, this thought, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse him. But somehow I was not able to tell him that. All I was doing was I, I was bringing out the gospel. I was sharing with them. I was saying, okay, see, this is what Jesus did on the cross. He died uh, uh, and he took our place. We don't have to live in sin. So just sharing the basic gospel, the simple gospel, four-minute gospel, what we studied last, last, uh, last year in uh, uh, Lifestyle Evangelism. As I was sharing, I remember the Holy Spirit reminding me of the blood. Right now, uh, it doesn't usually happen, but I kept saying, I, I kept thinking about the blood of Jesus. So I began to tell him, what is it that in this world, what is it that can give you joy and pleasure? And so he, he, start, he started saying, you know, these are the things uh, that I enjoy doing. And, uh, uh, and most of them were sinful things. And I, and I told him, so when you go back home, are you satisfied for what you have done? He said, no. And so I began to talk to him about blood, right? This regular blood. So I told him, what happens to a person if there's no blood in him? 
of course the person will die uh, you know extreme loss of blood person will die blood is life and so as we were talking uh, i brought out the whole aspect of the blood of jesus and what the blood of jesus does so by god's grace you know uh, it's not about me right it, it was just that i was reminded of that and i i shared with him i said this is what the blood of jesus can do you know you right now you and i are, are living in sin if we are living in sin we need to be washed of it there is nothing that can wash away our sins right there's there's no pilgrimage that we can go to there is no uh, you know it's not like we're going to have a bath and our sins are washed away no so what is the uh, so what is the outcome what are we going to do as human beings what should we do i told him this is what the blood of jesus will do it will wash away your sins and you will be forgiven of all your sins the moment i said that all of a sudden his mind changed right he started thinking you know this whole thing of being washed by the blood of jesus started you know i was just sharing simple right was, but it started hitting him and so he started asking me oh, what do you mean washed by the blood how can i be washed by blood and all of it and i began to explain what jesus did on the cross the blood of jesus the power of his blood and a couple of meetings down the line this young man was so you know so touched by the words the blood of jesus that he actually told me you know i i i do i want to give my life to christ because this these words the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness i gave him that verse it kept hitting him day and night day and night wherever you go the blood of jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness and because later on he gave his life to christ what are we saying the blood cleanses our conscience from dead works we may be living a most terrible sinful debauched life but just a drop of the blood of jesus can make us new can cleanse us that is why the devil does not want to want us to believe in the cross he does not want people from other faiths to believe in the cross because the devil knows the power of the cross he knows the power of the blood of jesus can do there is no entry when uh, you know for example we pray lord cover our house with the blood of jesus there's no entry for the enemy the enemy cannot enter because we've covered spiritually we've, we've been covered by the blood of jesus and this blood is not a blood you know uh, peter writes later on he says his blood still speaks right this is not blood that is lifeless this is blood that is alive this is blood that is true this is holy blood uh, and so as believers we must use this the blood of jesus we must understand what his blood did right uh, there are times when the enemy will bring thoughts in our minds take us physically bring us make us weak but we can say god i cover my mind with the blood of jesus i cover my body with the blood of jesus my family i cover it with the blood of jesus right jesus became the atonement just as the day of atonement the high priest would take the blood jesus did that with his own blood he became our mercy seat which means our complete reconciliation romans 3 23 to 26 for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus whom god sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance god has for pa had passed over the sins that were pre previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The word propitiation means an atoning sacrifice, which also means uh, mercy seat, an atoning sacrifice. Right now, Jesus is seated on his mercy seat. He has made propitiation. He has, he has, you know, uh, uh, through the blood, he has made a way for us to come to the Father. His death on the cross and his shedding of his blood, God showed mercy to us by uh, as sinners. He shows us mercy. Right now, many of us may be living some, maybe some kind of a sin. And it's way down deep in our hearts. Nobody knows about it. But I want to encourage you. At the cross, we can find forgiveness. At the cross, there's mercy for us as sinners. We can always go, me included. You know, there'll be times I may get upset. Um, you know, anger is, is a sin. There are times when we may say the wrong things. We may think about the wrong things. But as believers, we can always go back and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. And he is right now seated on his mercy seat. He very willfully and gladly will say, in my mercy, I will give, I forgive you. What a joy this is. Right? Now, uh, again, we need to be careful because Paul writes and he says, if we keep sinning, it's like we're crucifying uh, the Lord Jesus Christ once again. Just because Jesus is seated at the mercy seat, it shouldn't be like, you know, I can go ahead and keep sinning, come back, keep sinning, come back. We can't do that. Right? Uh, but we must be in a place where, yes, sometimes we sin unintentionally. We can always go to God, we can always ask forgiveness. Yesterday I was reading this document. Um, it, it was a documentary of, uh, uh, you know, what's happening in the church nowadays where many, many worship leaders are turning away from the faith. Wonderful gospel songs were written by then. We even sing it now. Um, they've been, you know, in the church for years and years. Many are pastor's children. Uh, and they've been there in the church writing songs, leading people in ministry, uh, leading churches, uh, leading worship ministries. Uh, but they've turned away from the faith. And I was listening, I was reading about this one, uh, you know, uh, it's an entire documentary and how this young worship leader, he's been serving the Lord for almost 20 odd years. But all of a sudden, he thought to himself, why am I still living in sin? It's been 20 odd years that I am leading worship, leading people to Christ. Why am I still living in sin? So that thought kept taunting him. And then the next, uh, you know, he, he, he himself writes and he says, after that, I started to think, you know, why isn't God answering the prayers of you know the poor people, the children, the beggars, the uh, those who are going through you know loss in their family, those who are going through uh, you know sicknesses and diseases and all of that? Why isn't God caring about all of that? People who have lost their homes through natural disasters, people who don't have food and clothing and, and, and all. So these thoughts started coming into his mind. And eventually, he let the enemy take control. And he writes there and he says, I have nothing against Christians. They are wonderful people. Uh, but I don't understand their God. So I you know, revoke this religion and I don't believe mm, uh, in what I've been professing. I turn away from it. I'm no more a Christian. And he's lost his faith. Now, after I read that, I was deeply saddened, but I thought to myself, where did 
where where was where did it go wrong? And I was I was just thinking to myself, I said, God, where did it go wrong? I just felt that it was condemnation, right? And all we need to do is go back to Christ and say, Lord, I'm not perfect, right? Uh, I'm still a work in progress. But Lord, by your mercy, my sins are forgiven. That's all he needed to do. I'm not passing judgment, but I'm just saying, right? Uh, that's all we need to do. Just go to Christ and say, Lord, you're seated in the mercy seat. You have paid the price. I know I'm not perfect, but you are perfect. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse me and forgive me of my sins. That's all we need to do, right? Yes, there are things that are happening around the world. We, we don't have control over it. And, you know, God knows what's happening around the world. But who, how can we question what God is doing? Right? God knows. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. You know, the Bible says that he, he sustains us. The psalmist says he sustains us in his hand. He who holds the earth and the entire world, the stars, he sustains them all. Will he not sustain his children? And so, we must be very careful because the enemy is able to make us, you know, he's an accuser, so he's able to make us feel condemned. Right? Even after we've asked for forgiveness, sometimes he may make us to feel condemned, make us feel that, okay, we are not washed or we are not cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We are still sinful. But I want to encourage you, uh, have faith and know in the Bible teaches us that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. That should be our approach. The reason I'm stressing out this is because we have a lot of students. We have a lot of young people that we see right now who, you know, get into, who know the gospel, who know the Lord Jesus, but all of a sudden they're turning away. There's no proper understanding. But I don't. I, I believe that we all understand what the blood of Jesus has done. And it still speaks. The blood of Jesus still works. The enemy, don't believe the enemy's lies where he says, okay, how can that blood which was shed over 2,000 odd years ago, how can that blood work now, speak now, heal now, protect now? Not possible. That's the enemy's work. And we can say, God, I trust in your word that the blood of Jesus is more powerful than any other work of the enemy. Because he's seated right now in his mercy seat. He has made reconciliation. He has made atonement. Never is God said to be reconciled. God is always the same. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he's the same tomorrow. He can act differently towards those who come to him in faith solely on the ground of propitiator sacrifice of Christ. Not because he has changed, but because he never, he ever acts according to his unchanging righteousness. Romans chapter 5 verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. You know, when we look at what's happening around us, it's very eminent, the second coming, the, the, the rapture, the things that are happening. Uh, it's all aligning to, uh, you know, to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus uh, can come anytime. The rapture can happen anytime and you learn more in the next year in end times and eschatology and Daniel and revelations. Uh, the end times, uh, uh, the rapture can happen anytime. But we can understand and know that we have been justified by the blood of Jesus. And we know that there is wrath for those who don't believe in Jesus, who have not accepted this. 
But one thing we know is we are saved from that wrath because of the blood of Jesus. He made Jew and Gentile one. Through him, we offer up our spiritual sacrifices. By the blood of the Lamb, we are cleansed, we are forgiven, we are reconciled, we are consecrated, we are released from dead works, we have been justified and made righteous, we have access to the very presence of God, and by the blood of Jesus, we offer up our spiritual sacrifices. What is our spiritual sacrifices? When we pray, when we worship the Lord, these are sacrifices unto God. Remember that verse in Psalms? We bring a sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. We offer unto Him a sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer unto Him a sacrifices of joy. When we are, you know, joyful in the midst of troubles and challenges it's a sacrifice unto the lord when we all go through challenges and tough times and we say god i trust in you i know that you are with me help me go through this difficult season help me to go through this mountain and i know that you will help me to pass through this when we do that when we are thanks thankful for that and we're trusting god it's a sacrifice a spiritual sacrifice to god god is pleased with it when we thank God for what he has done in our lives, he, it's a spiritual sacrifice. When we pray and worship the Lord in our, even in our homes or even in our church and our ministries, it's a spiritual sacrifice unto the Lord. The Lord is pleased with us. Right? The Lamb of God, he is eternal. The Lamb of God in heaven is forever Eternally, he will be recognized as the one who has taken away the sins of the entire human race. You know, somebody asked me, if Jesus has taken away the sins of the entire race, how come I, I, I still feel like a sinner? How come I still am living a sinful life? How come I don't feel like my sins are washed away? Now, the Lord Jesus did the work on the cross. He made it available. It is up to us to receive it from him. Right? The Lord Jesus is not going to, you know, and we learn more on this as well, uh, in, in Holy Spirit class as well. The Lord Jesus is not going to force himself upon us. You have to believe in me. When you look at the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus, he, he didn't do that. What did he do? He went, he found disciples. He said, yes, I'm the Messiah. He didn't say, please follow me. Please come. He didn't do that. You know, in Jerusalem, they denied him. Right? His own brothers himself denied him. In, in, in Jerusalem, they hated him. Meaning the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't want anything to do with him. Right? And his own hometown, his own people disregarded him. Remember Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Destroy this temple, I will build it in three days. What are they? What were the reactions? He said, let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. What is he talking? But when he went to different places, when he went to Judea, when he Samaria, they accepted him. And he was able to do a lot of ministry in the different in other places. But Jesus didn't go and force himself upon the Jews and the, uh, and upon the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, I remember we talked about this. He, when the disciples said, uh, how come they are, uh, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees are so leading so many people? Jesus says, leave them be. It's like the blind leading the blind. If the blind leads the blind, they both will fall into a ditch. So leave them be. Let them go their way. Jesus didn't force himself upon them. He made himself available to them. Right? And the Roman centurion came. Jesus didn't say, hey, you're a, you're a Gentile. You're a Roman citizen. And later on, uh, you know, you other guys are going to catch me and kill me. Did Jesus say that? He didn't say that. He made himself available. He said, the Roman 
uh, centurion said, you don't have to come home, just pray and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, what a wonderful faith. This man is of great faith. Go, it will, shall be so. Jesus gave, just heal him because he opened himself. And so if we are, or there are people who ask you these kind of questions, like, you know, why is it that I'm still living in this sinful life or this, uh, there's no peace, there's no joy. That's because we haven't received from him. He's there, he's willing. But we have to go to the blood. To, we have to go to the cross. The cross is not going to come to us. We have to go. We have to make that decision to say, God, I'm coming to that place of ultimate surrender and just surrendering to you. And then we will see his his love, his, his grace flow in our lives. Now the Lamb of God, he's eternal. There's no end for our Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy this is. There's no expiration date. Any time, like the thief on the cross who said, Lord, when you enter your kingdom, remember me. Just at the nick of the last moment of his life, Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. You and I can always go to the cross. Now we must go in boldness. We must go and just pour out our hearts. We don't have to hide things in our heart. We don't have to hide and say, okay, this I will ask forgiveness next year. Or this I will ask forgiveness after six months. He knows. The Lord Jesus knows everything in our hearts, but he's waiting for us to ask. As he says, right? Ask, it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will open. So that's what we must do. The blood of Jesus is able to bring us uh, forgiveness, to bring us uh, you know, to a place where we can say, God, I'm justified in your presence. All right. Let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue uh, from uh, the next, next chapter onwards. Let's take a break for 10 minutes. We'll see you at 11.